record this. Yes, we are. Hi, Igor. Great to see you on Instagram and FA Port. Thanks for being there with us. Good to see you as well. These are names that are so familiar. This is so fun. And uh, Denise and Amanda, I've been seeing your names lately as well. So that's lots of fun also. Just again, doing that one last double check on the various platforms to make sure that, um, that we are good to go. And we are fabulous. Shall we get started? That sound like a good idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So just want to take a moment right out of the starting blocks to introduce myself. And for those of you on, who are on Instagram with me, hi. My name is Judith Cobb, and I am a master herbalist, a natural nutrition clinical practitioner, a certified iridologist, and a certified comprehensive iridology instructor. I have been a holistic health practitioner for 40 years, yet four decades. It blows my mind. My husband and I were talking the other day because we just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I've known him twice as long as I've not known him, which is kind of bizarre. At any rate, time flies, right? And so um, I want to share this information with you because it is my mission in life and my passion in life to spread the word about constitutional iridology. And there's so much misinformation out there. And so I'm going to flip my phone around so you can see my PowerPoint slides. There we go. And we've got, uh, we've got everybody streaming. We've got audiences where we want them, which is very exciting. And we are going to roll with this. Oops, I just need to pull that over. Brilliant. All righty. So as we do this, I want to reiterate to each one of you that I love questions. My students will attest to the fact that I start every class with a, do you have any questions from anything we've covered so far? And I teach them that there's no such thing as a stupid question, that every question deserves an answer. And so with that in mind, I offer that to you today as well, that if you have any questions, I would love it if you would post them in the comments box or in the chat box. I will do my absolute best to keep on top of everything and I am popping over here with this, right? Denise is from Coldale, which um, is actually just about two and a half hours away from me. So that is a ton of fun to have somebody else from Southern Alberta here. Let's start with the very first myth that we want to bust. And this very first myth is all about the owl. Have you heard this story? If you've heard the owl story, I wanna see a hand raise or a yes, I've heard it in the comments wherever you're joining me from. I'm gonna share with you what it is for those of you who might not be familiar with it because this is the first myth we've gotta get rid of. The story goes, Katie says she's heard this right on. The story goes that a young boy, the age of 11, his name was Ignaz von Petschle, caught an owl or an owl landed on his arm, or maybe he found an owl. We don't know, there was a bird. And some people say it was a hawk. Some say it was an owl, so who really knows? And we don't know if the owl broke a wing or a leg. We don't know if it happened while he was trying to capture the bird, or if he found the bird already injured. Are you seeing where this is going, that there's a lot of unknowns about this? And it goes that as a boy of 11, he saw a dark line in the owl's eye and that as, or in the bird's eye, and as he nursed this bird back to health, this dark line disappeared. Now, I don't know what version of the story is correct, and I actually don't think that we need to worry about it, and I don't think we actually need to focus on this story. Ignat says that as, again, as, this, as he nursed this bird back to health, that this line disappeared. Now, when we look at Bill Cardona, who is one of the fathers of constitutional iridology in North America, he says modern iridology can't explain the owl story. Von Petschley's story from very long ago has not been reproduced, so it is just a waste of time to repeat it. It just creates confusion. 
Critical thinking is required when applied to any topic. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. How many uh, wild bird rescue facilities are there, even just in North America? Wouldn't you think that if this line happening in the eye was an accurate story, that some of these uh, veterinarians and caregivers who work in these animal rescue facilities, particularly the bird rescue facilities, don't you think they would have seen the same thing? All right, so doesn't that just make sense that this story doesn't make sense? So Bill go goes on to say, if you look at a picture of an owl's eye or most any animal, the structure of the iris is different from humans. There is no anterior stroma, just a smooth posterior leaf without individual strands of fiber. This is what makes human eyes so unique. We're going to look at human eyes in just a moment, and you'll see what we mean when we talk about strands of fiber. So it is structurally impossible to have such an event. Interesting. Amanda says she's heard this story before. Yep. Indeed. So let's bust a myth. And now that we know that humans are the only ones that have this kind of a fiber structure, even chimps don't have this fiber structure. They lack all of this fiber. Okay. And so uh, they don't have the fiber. So we can't, can't correlate what we see and know about human eyes necessarily to animal eyes. So myth number one is that is that we're going to take photos of your eyes now, we're going to put you on a super duper cleanse, and we're going to watch how your eyes change to monitor your progress. Have you ever heard or seen anyone say that? Have you? If you have, I want to know about that because it's a really common myth that's out there and you're not the first one to hear it, but I want to know who's heard this. Just, I've heard the myth or um, myth number one, yes, or whatever you want to say, let me know that you've heard this. Now, what I'm here to tell you is a couple of things because we know this for a fact, and this is a little case study we're looking at right here. Number one, the eye rides don't change fast enough to monitor any changes in a matter of a few weeks or months. The sclerae might change, and we see some changes in the sclerae here that are pretty obvious. Um, but that also then is going to be dependent on how acute or chronic the problem was. The second part of this is eye rides accumulate pigment, they don't disperse pigment. These are my husband's eyes. They are taken with two different cameras because this camera actually got stolen. And so two different cameras, totally different uh, imaging technology. These were taken 23 years apart. So he was 42 when we did this image and he was 65 when we did this image. So I want you to look closely. This first one is a scan of a print. So it was a four by six inch print that we scanned. This one that was done at the age of 65 just a few years ago is a digital photograph. So when you look at these, I want you to look at two things here. I want you to look at the color of the iris. Are they the same? And I want you to look at the color of the sclera. Are they the same? And look at the skin tones. Are they the same? Now the dead giveaway here first is that this light and this light are different. That tells you it's different cameras. That instantly raises any suspicion about anything as far as doing a before and after photo. Many of you are going to say, well, man, he's done some cleansing. This image is so much bluer. And these oranges, look, they faded. Wow, that's exciting, right? You're going to, many of you with that, the old, that are working under the old myths or that have listened to the old myths are gonna go, wow, people would say this is, is he's cleansed and he's done some great work. The truth is, that when we look at the skin tones and the sclera colors, we can see that these cameras had different settings for white balance. We can see that the source of the light was different. This was an incandescent flash. This was an LED flash. LED tends to be bluer. 
incandescent tends to be more yellow. That's going to account for so many of the differences we see here. So we can't call this a photo that proves cleansing because it doesn't. Again, pigment does not disperse. The other thing that makes a huge difference in the appearance of pigment, not only is the color of the light, but the intensity of the light because more intense light will actually wash out different colors on the image. So we know that tech alone accounts for the color difference. It had nothing to do with 23 years of me feeding him good food and plying him with supplements. I want you to also notice that in this image, we have some pigment from about six o'clock. And if you're, uh, those of you on Instagram, actually, I think you can see this right up here to about 8.15, or we can call that 30 minutes to about 42 minutes. He's got pigment here in this image that doesn't exist in this image. That is acquired pigment. And it's not that he's toxic. It's not that he needs to cleanse. It's that this is telling us that something inherently genetically has activated in his body and is creating stress. We're not going to erase this pigment. We can't dissolve it and wash it out any more than we can dissolve or wash out any of these, except maybe by photographic trickery. I want you to also notice the capillaries in the sclera up in this upper left corner. Very interesting. This capillary is quite heavy which says that we've got some congestion happening in, a, in certain areas of the body. But notice how 23 years later, that capillary is almost nothing. Whatever this congestion was, has pretty much cleared up. Notice though that we have this one that looks like a Harry Potter scar, right? See this? Notice how 23 years later, it is so much heavier. So this is suggesting congestion and vessel breakdown in an area of the body as well that we need to pay attention to. So the eye rides are inherently predisposed. The sclera are dynamic. Is that making sense? Does that fit? Does that make sense to you as I've explained it? Hi, Art of Health and Sayed and Ayman. Good to see you on Instagram with us. Thanks for being there. Another myth that we see, and I'm going to try to make this image better for those of you who are on Instagram. There we go. I just need to get this closer. Now you're going to have this a little bit shaky because I got to hold it to get this. Um, and that is the, the myth of healing lines, the myth of healing lines. Okay. So what we know about the fibers in the eye, actually, if I turn that off, does that help? Not one bit. Okay, just playing with the lights here and seeing if we can give you a better image, but it's not going to work. Um, when we look at healing lines, you will see many people that will talk about lines in the eyes that suggest that healing has happened. Now, if you've been with me, oh, Katie, thank you for saying this makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, when, when we talk about healing lines, they say that healing has happened. Now, these images, and again, I will help you out on Instagram. I'm going to move my phone closer to the screen for you. These images are of me. In 2017, I had taken pictures of my eyes because I like to do things like that, kind of geek out. And that's my eyes. Now look at where the arrow is pointing in the lower right side of the eye at about 20 minutes. I want you to really pay attention to what you see there. Well, in March of 2019, I fell, slipped on some ice, broke my wrist in two places, required a double surgery, and two metal plates to be installed in my wrist. Yes, I am semi-bionic now. And when we look at that very same part of the eye, can you see that there's not a speck of change? It's exactly the same. Well, one would think that first off, if the owl story was true, that there should be a black line because that's a pretty serious thing. Two broken bones, a double surgery, two metal plates installed, Shouldn't that show up in my eye if the eyes are going to change based on situation? And then we have May of 2019. Guess what I did? <laughs> so we're talking like, actually it was on Mother's Day, um, which was, I believe, May 12th in 2019. Just one week after getting the cast removed from the first breaks, I fell down some stairs and I broke the Olecranon 
off the same arm's elbow. So in that same arm reaction field, there should be something, but there's not. Now you'll notice that the color on these images is slightly different because I did tinker with the, the white balance on my camera and things like that. And so that will account for the difference in the color, but you still don't see, and sorry, this is tilted for you on Instagram, but you still don't see anything in that area. So now this is, this image is a week after I broke my arm the second time, had another surgery to repair. So I've now had, and had more metal installed, metal and wires and pins installed in my elbow to hold it together. Shouldn't we see something there? Then on August 5th, when I finally um, was totally healed up and feeling not quite so sorry for myself, <laughs> I managed to take photos again. And notice in that same area, there is nothing showing up in that area. Now, wouldn't you think that if healing lines were a thing, if they were really accurate, if we could add fiber to our eyes that you should see black lines, like what they say the owl had, that you should see more fibers being added as the area heals. Hi, Peggy, so good to see you. And Meg and Elizabeth and Araf, so good to see you on Instagram. Wouldn't you think we should see some things like that? Well, the good thing is the arm is healed beautifully. I uh, had a fabulous physiotherapist. I've got scars to prove that I've had all this done. So for those of you on Instagram, I don't know if you can see the scar that runs right down between the tendons here. Try to turn that around. It's healed up really well. Another one down here, you can actually see the metal plate here. On the elbow, you can see, maybe you can't, maybe that one's healed up even better. Woohoo, go me. Um, oh, you can see a bit of it right here, right? But there's metal in all of those. And yet there's nothing showing up in the iris photos. So healing lines, myth number two, busted. When we look at eyes, again, you're going to see a lot of people making the claim that you can cleanse toxins out. Now here again, for those of you on Instagram, I'm going to move closer so you get a better color reproduction. See all that bright orange hanging on around the center, close to the center of the eye. And again, these are the same photos of my hubby. And 23 years later, that bright orange is a little bit faded. That's not from cleansing, that's from technology changes again. That's from the camera having being set on, using a different camera altogether, a different light source. Even when we used to do prints of photos, even something as simple as the brand of photographic paper will change how the image prints up. Even something as simple as these big labs like you have at Costco and places like that that do photo developing, they can change the settings on their machines and make these photos look like whatever they want. So if you don't know exactly what their settings are, if you have not given them a color code, like taking a photograph of the film box as your first shot, taking that film box in with that roll of film and said the first image needs to print up to match the color on this box, then you don't know what you're getting back. You don't know how they've set their colors and you're likely to get inaccurate color representation back. So it's interesting that Harry Wolf, who is the father of the father of constitutional iridology in North America. He's the one who got Bill Cardona on board so they could start teaching this and spreading the word. Harry Wolf is a, an American born German. So way back about 40 years ago, 45 years ago, he got his hands on some of the original textbooks written by Joseph Deck and Lindlar and some of the other German researchers and he read them and it made sense. And that's why he started working with this. Hi, Mizek and and I shining good to see you on Instagram. This is what Harry says. In fact, it's bogus and a dogma only found on some holdouts from the Lindlar, Kreitzer, Jensen schools of thought. The notion that certain metals, minerals, toxins routinely show up as diagnostic indicators in the iris has long been refuted and pro proven unreliable. There is no evidence to support the notion that heavy metal toxicity is measure, measurable in the iris, likewise drugs and candida. The dark spots are inherently predetermined 
as is the overall color scheme. So when we see pigment in the eyes, this is inherently predetermined. Even when we see pigment come up at a later stage in life, it is inherently predetermined. When you look at a newborn baby's eyes, their eyes are pretty much just an even color. By the time they're six months, we are seeing the color become what it's going to be because all babies have dark eyes when they're born, some darker than others. By the time they're six years, if you watch that child's eyes, you could be feeding that child organically. They could be being raised in a loving environment. Everything could be perfect. You will see markings, fiber structures be mature in the eye. You will see, um, you'll see pigment mature in the eye. And it's not that they've acquired toxins. It's not that the body's breaking down. It's that their genetics are beginning to show through the eyes mature just as the rest of the body does. You know, we know that about a baby's digestive tract, that their digestive tract is not mature at birth. That's why we feed them breast milk, right? If you try to feed a brand new baby steak and potatoes, it's not gonna work very well, right? So just as their GI tract matures over time and their, their immune system matures over time, so do their eyes mature over time. Another myth that these lines mean you've got parasites. They mean nothing of the sort. So for those of you on Instagram, let's get a close look. See those black lines radiating out from the center of the eye? Yeah, the old school iridologists say that that means we can see parasites and that you've got parasites. They'll tell you how long it is and where it's sitting. And it's like, oh my goodness, so not true. These black radiating lines do give us information about the person. They do not tell us the person has parasites. Harry Wolf goes on to say this, American sources from the turn of the 20th century are very unreliable, repetitive, and very misleading with silly and debunked notions like drug spots, soric itch spots, healing lines, parasite lines, and brown eyes turn blue with detox. Okay, so we need to be aware that these do give us good information about various things, but they do not mean the person has parasites. So here's the deal. You know, we've got this myth that says that with iridology, we can diagnose, we can name a disease, and from that, we can then prescribe a cure. Only licensed medical practitioners are legally allowed to diagnose. Iridologists, even if you are an ND, ND as in a naturopath or an MD, should never diagnose from the iris. We need other things to corroborate what we're seeing and the diagnosis is not made from the eyes, but the eyes support what the diagnosis is. So I studied Jensenian iridology way back in the early 80s. I did Jensenian for about 10 years and I did a lot of diagnosing from the eyes back then. I told people what was wrong with them. Funny thing, I was usually wrong. I would say, your eyes say you've got this, this, and this, and they'd go, no, no, no. And I'd go, dang, but your eyes say it, right? And it, it's, that is what made me jump to constitutional. Fast forward 30 years ago, I got to learn constitutional iridology. And I found with doing constitutional iridology where I'm looking at what the eyes are telling me about the strengths and weakness the person has, their inherent strengths and weakness, that when I paired that up with my client's symptoms, I could understand why they had the symptoms and I could understand what we needed to do to nurture and support their body to help them get rid of the symptoms. We were no longer doing iridology, iridology to change their eye color, to heal their eyes. We were doing it to bring a healthy balance to the body. What I loved about this was I was always right, you know, because now I wasn't telling the client what was wrong. I was listening to what they said was the symptom and I was able to explain why it was there. And I could do an iris analysis very quickly because I didn't need to look for every detail in the iris now. I only needed to look for details that supported what my client's symptoms were. And because I was hitting the nail on the head, because I was asking relevant questions based on what the eyes were saying, I could create a much faster, much deeper rapport with my clients. Really, it was pretty much magical. 
love, love, love it. And I still do iridology that way to this day. Bill Caradonna says iridology. Now remember, Bill Caradonna is, I don't know if he still is. He was a registered pharmacist. He is now a very busy naturopathic doctor in Seattle, Washington. Iridology cannot be used to diagnose. It is a unique assessment tool to gain understanding of the blueprint of the body, including tendencies towards illness patterns or assessment of resiliency, resistance against negative influences. But diagnosing the presence or status of illness or disease is never appropriate. I love that quote, that is so powerful. So for the past several years, I've been teaching wellness practitioners like you, the art and science of constitutional iridology. And I want to just give you a 30 second infomercial. I'm not gonna go into huge detail because that's not what you signed up for today. Registration for the next go round, the next session of Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology is opening on, mm, what's our date? On Tuesday, on Tuesday. I'd love to share some of the details with you, but again, I'm gonna keep this super, super brief. Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology is the only live online mentored course for nutritionists and herbalists and naturopaths who want to streamline their clinical work without sacrificing client care so that they as practitioners can stop working unpaid overtime to develop client programs. How many of you are practitioners and you actually, after you've had your first appointment with your client, you go and you spend two or three or four hours creating a protocol for your client? but you don't get paid for that yet. That's the unpaid overtime. So you can stop overwhelming your clients with programs they just can't stick with. And so you can actually create programs that will increase client compliance, their success, and long-term retention. If you wanna learn more than just iris markers, if you want to learn how the iris markers play off each other, if you want to be mentored, in creating programs for your clients and learning how to do that. If you want long-term support and mentoring after, long after you've completed the coursework, join me for an info webinar on Tuesday. So Tuesday, July 21st, from at five o'clock, we're going to do an info webinar. For those of you who are live on the webinar right now, I'm gonna post the link for you in your comments. And I'm, yay, that worked. Okay, I get so excited when tech works. For those of you who are um, live with me on Instagram, go to my, my Instagram page, Iridology Education, and the link will be posted there. For those of you who are on Facebook, reach out to me and I will, PM you the link. All right. So again, the course will actually be starting on Thursday, July 30th at 5 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. It runs two hours per class for 20 weeks. And you can see the different time zones. Hopefully I figured those out right. So plug in 5 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time into a time zone converter and make sure we've got your time zone correct. And so again, to learn more about this course, about what we teach, about how it can help you in your holistic health coaching business, just reach out to me and I will send you the link so you can join me on Tuesday the 21st for the live info webinar. All right. All right, now, I'm wondering if there's any questions about anything we talked about today, yeah, about myths. Is there a myth that you've heard of that you are wondering what its value is, if there is any value? Any questions about the course coming up? Any questions about anything we've talked about today? Like I said at the beginning, I teach my students emphatically that there's no such thing as a stupid question. Health Minded, you're there with me on Instagram. Thanks, and Aesthetics, wonderful. Good to see you. Nilama, good to see you too. A5 above, so good to see you. So good to have so many people joining us on Instagram and in the webinar and on Facebook. I'm not seeing any questions come in. And so hopefully that means I answered your questions well. And again, I hope you will consider joining me for the, the info webinar on Tuesday the 21st. So that's just a few days hence. 
at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. If you want that link, just reach out to me. PM me if you're on Instagram or on Facebook, and I'll make sure you get the link. And uh, yeah, we will look forward to seeing you Tuesday night for that webinar. Take care and have a great day, and thanks so much for being with me. Bye for now.